this person is no it's not you because her travel is okay no 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 done by women, which we can see reflected in our panel today. Mm -hmm. We all live gendered lives, and so transforming society <laughs> to achieve gender equity needs us all, is to the benefit of us all, and is the responsibility of us all. Which is why, in today's panel, we are asking how we can engage men and boys in our work without seeing them as just a pathway to women's empowerment, but also not marginalizing the voices of women and girls on the other hand. We have an excellent panel today who will be speaking to this from several perspectives. <laughs> and then we'll have some closing remarks from Oswaldo Montoya of the Men's Conference. <laughs> and finally, we'll open it up to discussion. First up on our panel will be Ali Blitzke, a gender and evaluation specialist here at ICRW. Ali is leading our DC office's male engagement work <coughs> by Cartier Philanthropy, which inspired our event today. Ruti Levtov, Director of Research, Evaluation, and Learning at Promundo US, will share findings from Promundo's programming as one of the leading organizations on work with men boys. Ruti has played a key role in Promundo's research initiatives, including the International Men and Gender Equality Survey, or IMAGES which was a seminal study conducted in partnership with ICRW. Saba Gori, Associate Director for Social Empowerment at Women for Women International, will talk about Women for Women's male engagement economy and conflict effectiveness. At Women for Women, Saba guides social empowerment globally, which includes initiatives focused on male engagement and the prevention of gender-based violence. Finally, we will have Yoni Dandasan, who is the Global Director of the Men Engage Alliance. Through country-level and regional networks, Men Engage connects hundreds of local NGOs working on these issues across the globe. Yoni will share trends, challenges, and best practices that Men Engage is seeing on the ground. Following our panelists' presentation, we'll have some remarks from Oswaldo Montoya, who is the Global Networks Associate at the Men Engage Alliance. Oswaldo is also one of the founders of the Men's Group Against Violence in the Novel, which was the first men's group of its kind in Central America. Notably, with the exception of Oswaldo, <laughs> all of our speakers today are female. And this reflects an important point about engaging men in gender equity work, not just on the ground, but also at the institutional level. And we'll touch on this throughout our discussion today. 
After our closing remarks, we will have some time for questions and discussion. So we'll ask all audience members to hold their questions until the end. And we have a lot to talk about, so I will turn it over to Ali. Thanks so much, Lila. Um, the importance <laughs> of engaging men in gender equity work is, on the one hand, a bit obvious because they too hold up half the sky. But often um, in women's empowerment programming, it's only considered as an afterthought. And so we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into why that is and kind of what are some of the trends. Um, ICRW recently conducted a learning review of male engagement programming with support from Cartier Philanthropy. Cartier was interested in understanding what types of male engagement approaches are being implemented throughout the world, what's working, and where are there gaps. We conducted an extensive literature review, key informant interviews, and hosted a convening to ensure that our findings were aligning with experts' experiences. Um, the goal was to produce recommendations for both donors and practitioners. And we produced this brief. For those of you who are here, you can pick it up. Um, and it's also posted online. And we will be releasing a much longer report at the end of the month with the full findings. As we started to get into this review, we realized that there are a few key concepts underpinning this work that we first wanted to clarify. Empowerment is access to resources, which is knowledge, skills, assets, as well as power and agency, which is the ability to define and act upon one's decisions. And while empowerment is important to people of all genders, we know that due to systems of patriarchy, Women are often starting from a position of disempowerment and societal constraint. And so empowerment is especially important for women and girls. <laughs> gender equality is the equal treatment of all people regardless of gender. But this fails to take into consideration the fact that gender identity influences one's aspirations, access to resources, and opportunities. So gender equity, on the other hand, takes into consideration the diversity of all people across all genders, providing support and services, not despite one's gender, but in response to one's gender. I can't take credit for this graphic, I found it online, but um, it does a nice job of depicting this concept. So on the left, equality, they're given equal treatment, but due to kind of positions of disadvantage where people are starting, some are still unable to see the baseball game, or maybe it should have been the um, Olympic figure skating competition. <laughs> and with equity, the, the um, support provided is in response to the position where they're starting, so that they all have equal opportunities. As we clarify these concepts, it motivated us to really reflect upon how we're framing the objectives of male engagement programs. So we often think about engaging men for women's empowerment. But this is instrumentalizing of men in that we're kind of using them for women's benefit. We also think about male engagement for creating more positive masculinities, ones where men don't equate aggression or being the sole provider with being a good man. And while this is important and beneficial, it's still missing part of the picture. We need to recognize that we all live within societies that are made up of patriarchal power structures. We're all harmed by these structures, we play a role in upholding these structures, and we can play a role in transforming these structures. So rather than male engagement for women's empowerment, we want to think about it as male engagement for gender norm transformation to create gender equity. And when we use this framing, we want to make sure that we're thinking of men as co-beneficiaries in this process. So rather than partners, allies, gatekeepers of power, we want to see the benefits that men will also gain from gender equity. As we did this framing, we developed two different conceptual frameworks. Um, the first one maps the process of gender norm transformation leading to gender equity. The second framework layers on male engagement as kind of a programmatic strategy to achieve that gender equity. There's a lot on here. I'm going to go into it a little, but um, the graphics are in here and will be in the report we launch online as well. So first, if we look at the programmatic strategies across these various levels, we see at the individual level, we're talking about examining, questioning, and transforming definitions of masculinity and femininity, providing skills and resources. At the community level, collective action, 
at the institutional level, creating more gender equitable institutions such as workplaces, schools, etc. And at the policy level, um, engaging with policy makers to create more gender equitable laws and policies. Here's a process of behavior and attitude change. We often think of first changing attitudes and then behaviors. But with social norm change, this isn't always the case, that it happens in that order. Often people will change their behaviors because they think they should, because they're you know, trying to act in accordance with others, but internally they haven't changed their beliefs. But it's actually the act of changing one's behavior, kind of testing out this alternative way of being, that changes your internal attitudes. So it's this kind of mutually reinforcing process. This change leads to benefits for women, men, families, and communities. For women, increased decision making, access to resources, um, leadership. For men, enhanced relationships, um, enhanced life satisfaction with being able to fulfill alternative masculinities. And for families and communities, um, more economic and social stability and more productive decisions as well. I also want to point out on the far right, there's an arrow that's showing that this is the process of gender norm transformation and also the process of deconstructing the gender binary. So often we talk about men and women, and I'm doing that again today, but we want to be sure when we're thinking about gender norm transformation that we're including people of all genders and thinking of gender as a spectrum and how do we create equity across that spectrum. The next graphic layers male engagement onto this process. So just a few kind of digging in at the program strategy level, individual workshops for men and boys and women and girls, working in groups, community level, working with male champions, role models, campaigns, at the institutional level, ensuring accountability, um, and at the policy level, working with male policymakers to improve policies. Same change process, and then here, Rather than showing those same benefits, we've detailed out kind of concepts of the enabling environment that have shifted that will enable people to experience those benefits. And here the call out is what's written up at the top, accountability and complementary women's programming. So in order for male engagement programming to actually lead to gender equity, we need complementary women's programming going on so that women are also gaining access to those resources, agency, et cetera, and that the male engagement programming is being accountable to women's needs and women's movements. So main takeaways, all programming should think about how to engage both men and boys and women and girls to achieve their outcomes, and also think about how applying a gender equity frame <laughs> might shift program objectives, but create more sustainable change. As part of the review, after doing all the kind of conceptual framing, we looked into specific sectors at what male engagement <laughs> approaches were being used and what was successful. So health, economic development, uh, violence prevention, education, land and property rights, etc. But here are some of the best practices that emerged across those sectors. Um, first, use messaging that avoids a zero-sum game mentality, but also sets realistic expectations. So we want to get away from, if she wins, I lose. But also understand that as these power imbalances shift, things will change. Recognize the intersectionality of systems of oppression and power. Not all men feel like they're in a position of power, especially men coming, living in poverty, um, in conflict settings from marginalized groups. Important to recognize where men are and meet them there. Uh, be accountable to women's programming, women's movements, women's needs. And at the minimum, make sure not to further marginalize women. Start when boys are young and kind of adapt programming throughout the life course. Use gender synchronized approaches, which means working with both men and, uh, men and women, both separately and together, so that they can kind of question and interrogate together and also have safe spaces. Um, I was also on a panel recently where they were talking about teaching men and women about each other's situations. And the example of reproductive health with adolescents, <coughs> teaching boys about girls' reproductive health and girls about boys' reproductive health so they can see how the body and how norms kind of interact. Um, we want to promote alternative positive masculinities and particularly related to fatherhood. And I think Ruti will talk about this a little bit later. Use male role models and advocates, but make sure that those men who you're engaging as role models have really interrogated their own beliefs 
and are promoting the gender equitable beliefs that you want. And finally, acknowledge and address institutional hierarchies. So we often talk about changing individuals' attitudes and behaviors, but as I said earlier, we're all situated within these structures of patriarchy, and so we need to address those structures in order to create change. I also have a few kind of higher level research and programming recommendations that are <coughs> First, we want to focus on implementing and funding programs that seek to shift gender norms and use innovative measurement techniques that measure whether male engagement is actually contributing to shift in gender equity. Social norm change means moving beyond the individual level, long-term programming, and nuanced measurement. We want to explore if there's examples of male engagement in social movements that's been used to kind of heighten women's voice and women's concerns successfully and use these as um, best practices to be emulated. We want to focus on contexts where gender norms might be under particular pressure or quickly shifting. And Saba might talk about this a little bit. Um, conflict and post-conflict settings are a unique situation. Sometimes men are under extra pressure to perform rigid masculinities, or they might be away fighting, and women are kind of having opportunities to serve in different roles. We want to explore what types of media messaging and delivery content can be used to transform social gender norms, and also what complementary community programming is needed to make those messages really uh, take hold at the grassroots level. We want to focus on gender norm transformation in workplaces and think about how this can be used to prevent sexual harassment. We've seen a lot of sexual harassment allegations coming to light recently in the media, and Instead of using kind of punitive, legalistic responses, it would be great to explore how men can be engaged in creating more gender equitable workplace cultures that would prevent the sexual harassment from happening in the first place. And finally, our framework showed that what is most successful is working across all the individual, community, institutional, policy levels, but of course no one program can do it all. So it's important to build coalitions, work together, and finally, in this growing field, have events like we are today so that we can share knowledge and move forward together. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's really nice to be here. Um, and I feel a little bit like I don't have a whole lot new to say, but just say yes, what Ali said. Um, so I, uh, my name is Ruti Lekhev. I work at Pamundo. Um, Pamundo's been working for about 20 years with this very precise goal of actually promoting, we call it gender equality, but we mean equity, that one, um, and prevention of violence from this perspective, particularly of working with men and boys. What's really nice about that is it means we don't work in a particular sector because gender issues and gender inequality affect men and women and children and everyone across all of these sectors. So we get to sort of look across different areas that are generally quite siloed and think through what are the dynamics that need to be shifted? What are the systems that need to change to create change across uh, different areas? So we promote a, so I'll talk a little bit more about kind of programming and some of the work that we do there. What we promote as an approach is called a gender transformative approach to programming, which basically says, okay, we know that if this is a health program, we have health outcomes that we need to focus on. We know that if this is a violence prevention program, we have to focus on violence prevention. But in the process of doing that, we need to get to kind of the root causes, which are often related to gender and other inequalities. So a gender transformative approach is really a process that aims to engage participants in examining and questioning gender norms and imbalances of power, and then seeks to change those, right? So we don't have a lot of advertise, or well, we try to move away from things like advertising, you know, very macho men who say, well, you know, real man uses condoms with his partner because that reinforces a particular vision. We're trying to move away from, from reinforcing that, if that makes sense. And 
a lot of this happens at sort of individual or community group intervention type things. But what's true is you actually have to do this at a much broader scale as well. You need to think about, you need to get industries to question how they do advertising. And I actually just learned a couple of days ago that there is in fact now a big advertising industry campaign that's called Unstereotype that is working on questioning how advertising has been stereotyping men and women and their roles. So that was a very exciting kind of thing to see again. That's not happening at this community group level, but it's happening at a, at a much higher level. Um, Bruno's theory of change takes into account a lot of what Alan was talking about. In fact, was developed by a former ICW mm -hmm. colleague. Um, and basically, this again applies particularly for sort of individual and group interventions, but we sometimes focus on different pieces of it depending on, on where, we're, where we're targeting. So this is a process of critical reflection where um, participants learn and question critically what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? How has my childhood, how has the society around me influenced the way that I act? whether I'm a policymaker or I am a teenager in school, um, provide opportunities to sort of rehearse new behaviors and rehearse new attitudes in a safe environment, right? It's a little bit scary to do something that's outside of the norm, um, you know, and we've been thinking a lot about, depending on where you are, that can sometimes be more challenging as a man, um, you know, in, in, let's say here in DC, it's a lot easier for a woman to, you know, wear pants, go to work, we take these things for granted. A lot harder if your colleague, male colleague showed up at work with a skirt, right? So, so kind of the boxes in which we work and behave need to be stretched and allow us to stretch. It's useful to have a safe space to be able to, to practice that and do that. This kind of going back and forth between what changes first, the behavior or the attitude and the norm, we think again, those happen sort of in a process simultaneously. So again, opportunities where you get to do both of those things, you internalize, you live your life that way, and very importantly, it's gonna be very hard for you to sustain any kind of change at the individual group or community level without the supporting influences and structures, without good policies in place, without institutions that support people to, to act in this way. And those are often very difficult to change. Um, I wanted to say something about measurement because we need to, in order to sort of make the case for <coughs> gender equity work in general, you need to be able to show that it is amenable to change. So we have from one particularly the research team spend a lot of time thinking about measurement. Um, I'm happy to talk more about this, but just to say, I think we're getting better at it. We're able to look at measurement of attitudes of norms and of behaviors and to actually see some of this programming working. So again, happy to talk more about it, but we'll, we'll ask. Um, one of the core pieces of Promoters programming is a program called Program H&M that was, again, has about 15 years of experience now, um, has been replicated in many, many different contexts you see here, um, kind of different places where it's been adapted to. Um, I think one of the reasons that, and this is a reflection, not, a, not an official statement. Um, I think one of the reasons that we think it works, it's shown evidence of change on behaviors like sexual harassment, intimate partner violence, uh, sexual reproductive health behaviors like condom use and uh, seeking HIV testing. I think one of the reasons that the, the program seems to have consistent findings across different locations is because it's a, pro, it's a process, not a direct kind of curriculum. There isn't a set of you know, you have to know this information and these skills. It's this process of reflection, practicing that I showed earlier. And I think that's one of the reasons that it's been sort of adaptable to many different contexts. Again, because even though some of the specificities are different, the general reality of patriarchy and inequality is pretty consistent around the world. Um, one of the things that we tried to do, I think the point that Ali was making earlier about um, sort of men as co-beneficiaries, to us is really core to the work that we do, both because it's a very useful entry point to doing the work, but also because that's what makes it sustainable. When people see the benefits to themselves, the harm that 
being in a box, being you know rigid and constrained in the ways that you can be, um, is harmful. So we use kind of a what are we all going to gain from this as really a key aspect of our programming, um, and we try to find entry points where you're already you know there, there's not a lot of convincing to do. So for example, I think it is difficult to go into a community or to do any kind of community work and saying, okay, um, you know, men in this community, the rates of violence are about 50%. This is common in many of the contexts that we work in. Um, violence is bad, you're bad, we need to fix it. So instead, looking for entry points that are a little bit more positive, for example, things like fatherhood. So everywhere around the world, men express pride, they express love for their children, they want to be involved in their children. The way that they've been socialized to show that is to be a provider for children. So one of the things that we do, partly through our Medicare campaign, which um, we have many, many different partners in, in many parts of the world, is to show a different image of what does it mean to be a caring, equitable, nonviolent father. And so these are two of my favorite posters. One is actually from Nicaragua um, that says, and these are usually from the perspective of the child, and it says, I like that you respect my mother. Right? So you're my father, I like that you do this. You reinforce the positive elements, and still, we talk about violence, we talk about a variety of other things. Uh, this other one is, is a translation um, of a poster from Bulgaria, again, trying to play with this idea of stereotypes of the real man. Um, this is, so Medicare has a lot of different components, it has a strong <laughs> advocacy component, has public campaigns, it also has some programming, um, and we, recently did an evaluation, and sometimes the research person, I have to tell you about it, and I'm really excited about it, um, that really has shown very dramatic, um, positive impact across a variety of different outcomes. And I think that's really where there's a lot of promise for these kinds of gender transformative programs. You know, as a donor, you're getting a lot for your money if you're able to, in the same intervention, show significant substantial differences in intimate partner violence, in harsh punishment of children, in family planning use, in A and C visits, and, and then in kind of some of the gender elements that we're also very interested in, in showing shifting power dynamics in the home. So this was a randomized controlled trial in Rwanda. It's a relatively simple intervention, about 15 weeks of group education, so not terribly costly, not terribly time consuming, let's say. Um, and just so you see the differences in violence. Now, um, this is the, the dark bar is the control group, the light bar is the intervention group. We want to see a smaller intervention group uh, change. Um, I just want to point out, however, that 33% of women experiencing violence in the past year, and these are women's reports, is still extraordinarily high and unacceptable. But it's a huge difference. So. Um, lastly, just a few sort of lessons learned, I think these echo a lot of what Ali said as well. Um, the kind of critical reflection and questioning has to be the core of ch for change to happen. I'm sure all of us who do this work have heard many times both men and women reflect upon, you know, this is something I didn't think about before, but now that I do, I realize how it's affected me and how my life can change. Um, and it's a really powerful statement to hear from people, and it's something that I personally feel as well. Um, using sort of a positive approach, again, that everybody benefits from equality within reason, understanding that the process is difficult and can, and can cause tension, and sort of being aware of those of the harms that can happen in that process. Um, recognizing the role of trauma, I think particularly uh, working with men in conflict settings, women in conflict settings, uh, the trauma plays a role in both in childhood and in adulthood in the, in the way that we sort of become ourselves and, and addressing that in some way is important and we have some programming that does that. Looking very actively for opportunities for gender synchronization, I think often you see that there is programming for women, let's say around a particular outcome, but it's also not gender transformative, right? So, so Gender transformative work has to happen for all of us in order for us to, to change the system. And where, you know, I think sort of men sometimes having to think about reframing what power means when gender relations change, that's also true for women. So your role, your identity might also change. So, you know, when you have 
men, this men care campaign, and you're talking about men being more involved in the care of children and in the household, that's encroaching on women's domains, and we need to, to talk about what that means and what that looks like. Um, involving community members and participants in the program and campaign design, I think that's kind of a lesson for all of us programmers that we already know and important to reinforce. Um, training and supporting facilitators. So I think there's a lot of talk about how can we do this, you know, in a more cost effective way and less training and less support, but having facilitators that are able to kind of guide this sort of process of self reflection is, is really important and they need support um, in, in doing that. Um, I think there's also a sense of, you know, oh, well, could we just get governments to do this? And the truth is, you know, all of us in the society are embedded in the power relations and, and gender norms that we have. And so thinking very carefully about how you move this to an institutionalized context, sometimes that means it's moving away from the grassroots social movements organizations that have this deep commitment to, to gender equality or equity. Um, having most multiple components, just like Ali said, working across different areas, so not just programming the individual level, but changing the policy discourse, changing the debate. And I think this is something that has actually happened in the Daniel probably talk, uh, uh, is better positioned to, to talk more about that. Some of the things we're specifically thinking about is how do you link these kinds of norms interventions to changing of material realities? Um, so, you know, making sure that people can actually act on new normative elements, you need to make sure that those are kind of, whether it's cash transfers, whether it's poverty alleviation, those things need to be in place. Um, and then linking through to institutions. Um, I just have one last slide since I know we'll talk a little bit more about this later, this issue of kind of the, the Me Too moment and sexual harassment. Um, we recently did an analysis. This is data from three countries, um, Mexico, the US, and the UK. And uh, this is a study called the Man Box. Um, and we just did an analysis. We looked at the, the relationship between attitudes and, um, and sexual harassment perpetration. And so what you see here, these are quintiles. So you divide sort of the range of attitudes into five different points. Those with the most equitable attitudes in all three countries are less likely to use, these are men, to perpetrate sexual harassment. I think this was in the last 30 days than those with the most harmful attitudes or most inequitable attitudes. So just to say, like, like Ali was saying, a punitive legal process is not going to solve the problem, right? What we need to do is we need to address the, the kind of systems and norms around that. So that's it for me. Looking forward to questions and thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really uh, happy to be here, and thank you so much for uh, including Women for Women International um, as a part of this discussion. I'm going to talk a bit more um, about our program, our program, and looking at the programmatic approach uh, to why we're um, engaging men, and give you some examples from the field and some of the countries that we're working in on how our program is designed um, and what we're learning from some of the lessons that we've seen. Um, you know, this question of why are we engaging men, especially when we think about women for women's primary focus, as an organization we started out and we still do focus primarily on marginalized women, but realizing very much uh, the importance of engaging men um, as partners, as a part of this work, um, has uh, we have designed a complementary program of men's engagement. Um, and we've been working with men since 2002. Um, so for, for quite some time, we've been um, working with men and engaging men and boys in this work. Um, we have a 12, just as a little bit of background, um, we have a 12-month, very comprehensive social and economic empowerment program where we're working with the most marginalized women. And as we started our work, um, specifically looking at some of these key outcomes, we realized that um, the women were not able to fully benefit um, from the work, from the training, from being fully empowered really without working with the men and boys in the community and in their families. And so we define men's engagement um, as a process that aims to really engage <coughs> men as allies and supporters of women's rights and women's empowerment. 
And the, the definition is grounded really in the idea that women and men are partners who should work hand in hand to achieve gender equality. And that by educating men and influencing their attitudes and behaviors, that men can play a positive role in advocating for and improving women's lives, but also in their own lives as well, as, as we've talked about how, um, uh, how important it is. Uh, women's empowerment is not solely in the domain of men, but uh, women, but uh, obviously everybody in the community and society. Um, some of our key objectives in our program is, um, in, in, first and foremost, as we started out, it enabled and improved women's participation in our program. Women were saying that you know we were not able to fully uh, realize the benefits of the program without educating the men and involving them. Um, so it helped to create support for and success of women's new economic and social activities as they were going through the program. Um, helps in shifting power dynamics and social norms. Um, eventually, this work has to we have to shift the underlying power dynamics and norms and see actual long lasting change has to involve everybody. Um, creating a positive household and community environment, some of the um, um, objectives include seeing improved outcomes for men. Um, and some of the things we've, um, others have already talked about, so I'll kind of go skip over that a little bit. Um, talking about our program. So it started in 2002 in Nigeria. Um, so far, we've reached 26,000 men. Um, our current men's engagement activities and work is in Nigeria, Afghanistan, Rwanda, DRC, and we're going to be working in Kurdistan as well, in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. So the way that we work um, is we focus on two or three uh, target groups initially. So these are leaders, influencers, religious leaders, community men, and male partners of enrolled women. Um, so we work with three levels of engagement, and we call them our level one leaders are the community influencers. Um, they're the leaders, the religious leaders, who then go, who go through this um, training program, this intensive training program, where they then go out and train additional men. We call them our level two leaders, who um, who are usually comprise of other community members, um, male members, and family members of the women in our program, who go through this step down training, um, and and that's kind of like the graphic there that shows how it's a it's basically a group of master uh, trainers who lead this effort. And then we have level three trainings, which involves the broader community, community forums, and includes other kinds of messaging, like radio programming, um, and, that sort of, um, and that sort of work. So we have different variations of the model. I'm, I'm sorry if you can't read that very clearly, but <laughs> you can pretty much see that across the board, the program varies from country to country. It varies um, based on the cultural context. The duration might be different. So we in, in GRC, we might work for initially a five-day intensive TOT for leaders. Um, same might be in Rwanda, whereas in Afghanistan, the initial uh, training will be three months with religious leaders. And it varies across the country. The topics are different country by country. Again, this is driven very much by what the community needs, the issues that the community identifies. Um, we do have common, you know, uh, topics that we want to address, but such as uh, sexual and gender-based violence, um, reproductive health, which includes family planning, HIV, STDs, women's contribution in society and their role in society is very important. Financial management, we have some of those are common themes, but then if you look in countries like Afghanistan, where we're working primarily with imams, it's all based on um, a religious context. Um, whereas in Nigeria, our program um, identified that uh, drug abuse is a big challenge there. Um, and so we include that topic. So it varies topic by topic. Um, we're also applying and learning and looking at new approaches. We just started this really interesting program in Afghanistan um, called Community Protection Committees. These are basically graduates of our men's engagement, our men's engagement program, um, who go on to basically engage other men, but it's it's involving the existing traditional models that exist in Afghanistan of community uh, uh, resol resolving community problems, but trying to sensitize them and make them um, more gender 
equitable. And so we are working in the community, taking up cases um, specifically focused on GPD and giving referrals to, to, to women and handling and men and handling uh, handling cases. Um, in DRC, we have a new program that involves couples, if they're called couples dialogues. So it's basically spaces for women and men to discuss issues in like GPD um, in a public setting. So couples who maybe have problems come together in this very community setting um, and talk about the problem Problems and they take um, they make commitments not to not to do uh, not to commit violence anymore and have a more healthier um, healthier life community and home. And so since um, since the beginning of our work, of course, we have very robust monitoring and evaluation. But um, specifically last year, we have um, improved upon and, in question, and incorporated a lot of different questions from uh, the GEM scale, looking at knowledge questions, attitudes, behaviors. And I want to talk um, specifically about some of the results that we've seen um, amongst our graduates in Afghanistan. So uh, out of a group of that was measuring behavior, looking at behavior change. Out of a group of 560 graduates from Afghanistan, at enrollment, 50% report taking action to share information on um, the harmful effects of violence against women. At graduation, it rose to 39%. 16% report taking action to stop, uh, to stop um, violence in the community. At graduation, it was 41%. So we have seen concrete um, results um, and positive results from um, from our from our work, and we also though are learning constantly learning on how we can make improvements to our men's engagement activities based on the learning, based on the research, based on some of the lessons that we've learned. Um, so, for instance, to actually see longer lasting change, we know that you have to train and work with men. For more consistent periods of time, um, we need to be working with men at different levels in the community and include husbands and male family members, which we are doing. The integration of different activities, a combination, the combination of group education sessions and awareness, which shows strong evidence of changing attitudes, with community outreach campaigns, which which may show which shows more positive impact in changing behaviors. Um, we're also uh, in our work, especially in where we're working, in, in the countries we're working, we're looking at the impact of violence and conflict, where violence has become the norm in the countries where we're operating. How does it really affect both men and women in designing that in designing the program in that way? Continuously promoting uh, continuous learning. Um, so, for instance, the example I gave of the community protection committees in Afghanistan, we are right now um, doing a learning exercise there so that we can learn from what's going on. How can we improve? What are some of the challenges there? Um, assessing the way we manage and implement and engagement activities to look at some of the best practices. Um, and this is just one learning of, um, of, of a study that was done of our program in Nigeria. We uh, had a, a, a three-year grant from DFID, and we had a longitudinal, which included a longitudinal evaluation of some of our work that looked at our step-down training of different levels, one of levels one, two, and three that I that I described earlier, and showed some um, interesting results that there was a six percent improved score amongst men in the group that we worked with um, on a behavioral index. So there were some changes in behavior specifically that measured men's adherence to judicial norms of masculinity, negative reproductive and sexual health behaviors, the use of physical and verbal violence. But there was no um, real difference in scores um, when it came to attitudes. Um, men would still revert, reveal, uh, reveal resistance um, to women taking up leadership roles or man rights. Um, and those were in both groups that we measured. So that helped us develop a few um, recommendations for how we can improve our work. So they, we had some conceptual recommendations from that study, which we are now taking, which we are actually at have, it's, you know, moving forward, just redesigning some of the uh, programming that we're doing. The importance of connecting knowledge with explicit attitudes and behaviors, the importance and necessity to reconcile these local traditions and training topics and religion with the training topics, Focusing on knowledge and behavior before attitudes, 
um, and some of the training recommendations um, revolve around first clarifying some of the misconceptions, limiting training topics, increasing collaborative activities and role play, and holding multiple sessions and follow-up training, especially for the trainers, that ongoing training, that ongoing, and I don't want to use the word training, but ongoing engagement, community buy-in, support is so important. And for, for that reason, actually, in all the countries we work in, we have men's engagement uh, coordinators who are from the community. They live in those communities. They understand the needs and they understand best how to approach these issues of patriarchy. Um, because especially when we're working from within a traditional and religious framework in some of our communities, you do have to tackle patriarchy and interpretations, but it does take time and it takes continued engagement. Um, and some of the improvements were already being, that we're making um, we're in Nigeria, we're looking at how we can increase the length of the trainings and have fewer people in classes and maybe give financial incentives. That's another issue of, of, that's quite challenging. Um, is how to um, pull people away from their everyday lives and work to go through this. To go through this. <laughs> so thinking that through, um, in Rwanda, uh, our, our office would like to increase the length of time of the training and include men and women together. And what we're hearing, which is really so amazing, is you know, we were, we've primarily been working with women, but the men want the programs too. They want to be a part of it. And they ask us this, well, why our wives are going through this program? Well, why can't we have something like this? Um, DRC wants to re-examine some of this training materials. Um, and we have so many stories of impact and stories from the field. And I uh, actually have some material out there if you all would be interested in, in, in reading more about that. But uh, a couple of quotes that really jump out um, are here uh, as well. So I look forward to questions and, and discussion. I think we're waiting for the video. I'll just get resettled a little bit. Are you lying? Man up. That's a woman's role. That's not a man's role. Oh, I'll just start it over. <laughs> I see at that size. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I really want to thank the organizers for having us here. And uh, we have a long uh, standing partnership, I think, with all the, all the organizations on the panel. So really excited. Very uh, thanks to everybody for, for being here. And uh, if it works. Why are you crying? Like, man up. That's a woman's role. That's not a man's role. C'est garçon, yeah. All right. N'importe madame, c'est pour tendre qui ça ou même cap duo. Lavamos, planchamos, cocinamos, limpiamos. Spreading my seed, that's what being a man is supposed to be. You can't let your woman punk you like that in the streets. ¿Qué tú estás haciendo ahí? Cambiándole los pan para el muchacho. Está loco el muchacho. Tú eres el hombre de la casa, de la madre que lo hace. If you don't keep your wife in line, if she doesn't follow what you say, then you're weak. We all know that's BS. I think it's crap. In my opinion, none of us are born with these ideas. It's old school, man. You know, it's just, it's 1920, 1950 shit, yo. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just idealism that we're discussing. We're discussing real flesh and blood human beings that are your brothers, your sisters.
domestic violence has really like left a permanent mark on my life. Men still control society on a certain level. I've seen it with my wife, um, and I've seen her be judged and be not given up, not be given opportunities. As a young child, you know, I was always told that you know a girl ought to do this; she ought to live this way. And uh, I don't want my daughter to feel like that. We want a world where men and women are treated equally. And to do that, you need to work with men. We can't just say that gender equality is something that women should work on. C'est nous-mêmes ensemble qui besoin changer. We're working with men to improve the lives of women and girls and families and communities. To change what they think it is to be a man. To change gender stereotypes, to break social norms, and to promote gender equality. I ask myself every day, what can I do to be part of the solution? My father was never there for me, and I don't want to be like that. I want to be different. Vamos acá. Yo quiero señales que puedo cambiar el mundo. Y si yo le puedo señalar eso a él, él lo puede señalar a su hijo. Generation Day. Tout bagaille a changé. Pichi, pichi, pichi. We as men need to step up. And we need to support that. So that we can change the world. Thanks. Once again, thank you for, for having uh, me represent a little bit about Men Engage Alliance. And um, this video was actually made in 2014, so some of the stats are a little bit outdated. We did a big global gathering in, uh, in Delhi and in India at the time, and we do that every several years to kind of bring that community of practice on engaging when boys and women form masculinities together. And we're planning another one in 2019, 2020. Um, but maybe just to update, start with a little bit of update. So Men Engage Alliance is uh, basically a, a network uh, with about 700 members all around the world. Um, civil society organizations, researchers, uh, individual activists, and we're organized in, uh, well, we're present in 73 countries and we're organized in, uh, in 42 country networks and with six kind of regional, regionally organized uh, networks. So really, I would say um, a bottom-up approach. I think what's very important for us is that um, we're called Men Engage Alliance. Um, but it's not that we're an alliance of men working for men. And that may be stating the obvious, but I think sometimes uh, what we find is that, that it's not that obvious to, uh, to many people. Um, I think it's important to articulate that Men Engage Alliance's network consists not only of organizations focusing or organized by men, uh, but also a lot of basically women's rights organizations, as well as LGBTQI organizations. Uh, youth organizations, faith-based organizations. So it's a very, very broad coalition. Um, and that coalition basically comes together around the uh, belief that we need to engage men and boys for the purpose of transforming patriarchal masculinities and for the purpose of advancing uh, women's rights and gender justice for all. And I think also that is very important to keep in mind, that we always think of men and boys are engaging in a voice, not becoming an end goal in and by itself, but towards what purpose are we doing this? And are we always clear that we are advancing towards those goals that we set for ourselves? Um, one of the things that the organizers ask me to reflect on is some of the trends that we see in this, uh, this work. Uh, and I would say one of the first thing, trends that I, I want to speak to is that um, I think so far a lot of the work on engaging men and boys has been quite focused on what I would like to say men in development. Um, I, maybe many of you know from the, about the transition from the notion of women in development to uh, gender and development. Um, and I, I see that still a lot of the work focused uh, with men and boys is focused on those kind of development issues. Uh, like uh, health, uh, like ending violence against women and girls, um, um, in education, um, uh, sometimes political participation. I think all of those elements are very, very important. I think at the same time, we're also advocating for taking that next step, politicizing the work on masculinity and the work with men and boys. And 
I quoted that as men and masculinities in feminist activism. You can say call it uh, men and masculinities in gender justice activism, uh, but really uh, becoming allies with that feminist women's rights struggles uh, with the LGBTQI movement. I think at every single level, uh, because these issues are very complex, but we really want to mobilize the men and masculinities and gender towards all of those uh, elements. And I think one of the key things that we're then asking for is for men and boys, not necessarily to occupy feminist spaces, but to make the spaces that they occupy feminist. And that means really doing that at every level in your life and also specifically working with men and boys in positions of power. Um, I think what I just want to highlight here in our mission statement is that that kind of addresses, I would say, articulates the overall agenda how we see this work. So working to transform unequal power relations and patriarchal systems, and I'm very happy that many people here on the panel have already uh, articulated that, that holistic approach to looking at patriarchal systems as well. But by addressing masculinities, by building inclusive alliances from the local to the regional to the global. Uh, working with men and boys through intersectional feminist approach, and I think that's key because that looks at diversity in multiple forms of, of oppression and also how power and privilege intersect with masculinity and being men. Um, and what we then in essence do is foster <laughs> joint actions in partnership with women's rights, gender and other social justice movement, movements. Um, I'll quickly touch upon this. It's basically how we organize our work. You will see that that still has a lot of focus on uh, eliminating gender-based violence, on advancing men's roles in, in unpaid care, um, in um, sexual reproductive health and rights for all, and in peace and security, but also emerging issues around um, what can this the whole notion of engaging men mean when it comes to support for equality and justice for LGBTQI struggles. And one of the things that we're doing there is organizing a learning circle with people with expertise on men and masculinity's work, people from the LGBTQI movement, and really talking to each other and having dialogue around what does this mean? How can we bridge the gaps? Because one of the challenges we do have is that when you talk about men engaged, you tend to almost immediately reinforce binaries. And we don't have how we can bridge that, but we are having conversations about this and di having dialogue spaces is, I think, very important in that. Um, okay. So one, yeah, this has already been shared as well. This is around um, the gender transformative approach, basically, and. I would just add to what's been said uh, so far um, that I think what we see in the, the momentum around Me Too, there's a lot of interest now in what it means to engage men in this discussion. And I think that's an opportunity for us all. And I was very inspired by something that Jackson Katz said in a panel last week, um, that he said, well, in our, in our work on engaging men, we basically have one consensus, and that is on doing this in transformative ways. And what does that mean? Well, one of the things that it means is that we give men and boys the tools to, to think critically about their own attitudes and behaviors, and that we move beyond an interventionist approach, that we're not just telling men, which is sometimes happening now, I think, in some of the programs on colleges, to step in and protect women, um, or to be kind of the savior of the day uh, for women, but to really if they want to be part of women's rights movements and addressing all of these issues, to dig deeper and to have that internalization part of the process and reflecting on their own roles, how privilege plays out in their own lives, um, and what does it mean to be a man in uh, interacting with, with people who experience multiple forms of oppression. And I think that kind of work, and we, we phrase a lot of this work around accountability, how can we strengthen that the work that our membership is doing is really accountable to women's rights struggles to other people's rights? Um, I also was very inspired by this quote, which is I, I, I saw this on Twitter. I wasn't able to find more about this person other than that her name is Yolanda. And that's, yeah, I would like to give her more, more than just this voice. But 
in the light of all, uh, of all Black Lives Matter, she said, white people, no one is asking you to apologize for your ancestors. We are asking you to dismantle the systems they build and that you maintain. And I thought that's so interesting also when you talk about engaging men, that there's a lot of, and it's also in light of the Me Too uh, uh, movement, is that there's a lot of, there's some backlash happening now around Me Too, and men say, you know, now all men are, 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 are facing problems where we are all uh, kind of having the sense that, that we are that the problem is with us but I'm a good man I've never battered anyone and I think that's fantastic but we're calling for that next step for the good man also to step up and to, to be aware that they're still part of the system that may change patriarchy and so there is a role there is a role for those good men to do more to really be that active bystander and in every situation that you can step it up, hold other men to account, um, support good, like good workplace policies to be in place, um, support advocacy locally go on the streets, really calling on men to be part of, of that whole, I think, momentum that is happening right now. Um, yes. Trend number two that I wanted to share a little bit about is that we really see an increased interest <clears throat> at various levels uh, in engaging men and boys' work. And I think that we, I mean, as Men Engage Alliance, we very much welcome that. We think that's a positive trend. And at the same time, and I think the fact actually that this, this discussion or this conversation here today generated so much interest and so many of you came. I heard that there's several hundred people actually signed up for the live stream that means there's an interest in engaging men and we welcome that and but we also really want to be here together to think through how can we do that in sensible ways so that engaging men and boys does not become the next so-called silver bullet and pushes away like women-led women's rights feminist movements organizing uh, and it also applies the funding stream how do we make sure that we do not compete for the space but that the men and masculinities work really contributes and, and empowers and supports um, basically the, the, the mobilizing is being done by the um, One of the ways in which we're doing that um, is being a global alliance with a lot of membership doing work on the ground. We advocate at, the, at UN spaces, UN policy making spaces, because that's one of the places where norms are set. Um, and so I just wanted to share a little bit, for example, um, on the sustainable development goals or on the outcome documents of the Commission on the Status of Women, we advocate for human rights based, feminist informed, gender just and gender transformative language on engaging men and boys. And we've been quite successful in doing that because several increasingly UN policy making includes that kind of language. Um, and one of the things, there was actually a resolution that some of you are, have an interest in this work and really build on. It was a Human Rights Council resolution that was adopted last year, um, which, which we think really takes that next step in gender transformative language and engaging men and boys. Um, and we, I also wanted to flag that we are briefing the CEDAW committee uh, in a couple of weeks from now, um, because again, we see an increased interest in this work. So how can we work with the CEDAW committee that has worked historically very much you know, had a focus on women and girls, how can we help them, empower them to play a role that is constructive towards the increased kind of uptake of engaging men and boys' work? And how can they also advise governments to do this in, in sensible ways? Um, I want to end with a quote from Iceland that um, was a movie I watched a couple of, uh, of months ago on uh, in Iceland in the 80s and 90s, women were really organizing themselves to uh, have seats in parliament. And I was very inspired by this quote, which to me is about movement building and about network building. And it says, they asked us to send our leader and we said, we don't have one. And they thought we were stupid and we didn't know what we were doing. And they are the men in, in politics in this case. Um, and, but then our res response was, this was a way of doing things. We sent a different woman to represent us every time. And I find that really inspiring when we build movements and when we work together, that we don't always have the same people talking, but that we have different people talking, different people representing the same agenda, um, and that we build alliances. And um, I think that's 
basically why I work with many gauge a lot. Because that's what we do. Um, and I think that's it. I just want to thank you again and uh, really looking forward to having at least a little bit of time uh, for discussion. But before we do that, uh, we've already said it, um, it's funny, we're an all women's panel. Uh, and um, actually, I think in Gage is not definitely not only women working. I think I was actually hired a couple of years ago to diversify the fact that we were not only presented by men. But I want to welcome uh, Oswald and Montoya, who is my dear colleague, um, and who's been with the Gage Global Secretariat since 2013, to uh, give a couple of uh, closing remarks and share some of his reflections. <coughs> Thank you, Julia. Thank you, everyone. Um, may I ask something? Can you can we stand up for a moment? Yesterday there was a tragic in this country, Florida, between people that are in high school. And we know the, tra the ongoing tragedy in South Sudan, in Afghanistan, in Iraq. In so many places in Mexico, because of the in El Salvador, in so many places in Syria. So, I would like if we can just have a moment of silence to recognize all these people who have died, but who are dying every day. Regarding the the uh, mass shooting yesterday, I was watching the news this morning, and one senator from Florida said that this is inexplicable, inexplicable tragedy. And I don't know if it is because English is not my first language, but inexplicable means that there is no explanation, right? Because there is other way to use that term in English. Because it is explicable. There is an explanation for what happened yesterday for what happened in many places for these violent crimes. And part of the explanation is about masculinity. It's not the whole explanation, of course, but it's part of the explanation. And I think that's uh, extremely important to remember. I also watched the, I mean, this, this tragedy very to me this morning and I watched uh, someone from the White House who do it every day. And part of the prayer says, the shooter was mentally disturbed dis dis and a big problem. Part of his, not the whole uh, cure. So the shooter was mentally disturbed and a big problem. Reminding me that this is the typical bad apples approach. Mm -hmm. So there are some bad apples out there who are really hoping some bad apples that we need to stop, separate from the good people, and then we'll be fine. Right? That's, that's the, the, the dominant narrative that continues in many places. That there are some bad apples, some bad men doing these crazy things. And that's why there is all this violence. And I think one of the great contributions with the framework that ICRW put together, and the great contribution that have been for years by organizations like Romundo, the work that we are doing with Engage, what Women for Women just presented is to educate us that this is not about a few bad apples. It's not about um, a few guys doing this. It's about the system. It's about the system that is something wrong. Uh, one of the uh, teenager survivors yesterday who was interviewed in TV said something that I think he, he, he he tweeted something when he said, there is something wrong here. There is something seriously wrong going on, he said this morning. I think he tweeted that it's more than just a few crazy bad apples. There. And it's also about how the rest of us maintain this, as Johnny was telling us, how we maintain this system. So I really want to, uh, Thanks for 
this instrument that we are seeing here, these good practices, it gives you the opportunity to do this work with your own voice in a way that is really comprehensive, that is really holistic, that doesn't talk, that, that don't, don't offer individualistic solutions that we know don't work. I mean, of course, we have to target the individual, we have to do individual, but it's not enough. We need to work at all these levels that so well have been explained in this uh, in, in this um, presentation. There was one journalist this morning that asked uh, a lawyer of the family who, who hosted the, this, this boy, this, uh, this shooter. Uh, she said, depression is a red flag with young men. Access to arm is a red flag in young men. So she was building a question. And so she mentioned this to see that depression and access to arm are red flags for young men. I I was thinking, what about being male? Is being male a red flag for, for, for mass shooting? Um, my response would be no. Being male is not a red flag for, for, for violence, for mass shooting. But being right, raised male in patriarchal societies, it is a red flag. That's the problem. The way men, the way boys are raised, is a red flag for many of these harmful um, behaviors and practices. There was another expert, and sorry for concentrating me a lot on what happened yesterday in the news, but I think it's so relevant for the work that we are doing. Um, another expert was proposing to widely perform a screening test for depression to all or everybody so that we know who needs help to prevent this fashion. I would say, what if we propose also a screening test for toxic masculinity? We should propose that. I think we will go with the gem scale. <laughs> <laughs> and propose yeah. and pass this test to all men. Huh? And there are linked with depression because toxic masculinity sends you to depression, to not being able to cope with with things in a healthy way. That's that's a great point. And I think we need uh, also to think about other measures to to screen uh, not only toxic masculinity at individual level, but also at the institutional level. Because we know there is the red culture, the domestic violence culture, that uh, is beyond the individual, but it's there in the air that facilitates the harassment, that facilitates violence against women. And we need to screen instead of that as, as well in order to target where are the hot places in, in societies. Um, so it's really, this is the, the, the deeper work that we need to do. Um, a month ago, um, my family, we bought a, a, a sofa set, a sofa in a state, a state um, cell. So we need to pick up this furniture, this piece of furniture, my children were not available. So I asked three boys, <coughs> the others in my neighborhood, they can help me do that. They, they said yes, they were excited because I offered some compensation. <laughs> <laughs> we went to the place and as we was, I, was, I was driving in the car, the three of them were behind me. And one of them was saying, three teenagers, boys, he said, I'm gonna wear a ring in my, in my right uh, um, ear. So the other boys say, hey, that's gay. That's really gay. I said, no, 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 said the third. Wearing two rings is gay, but wearing only one is not gay. And then the other said, no, it's on the, so they were, <laughs> what is not gay around with wearing a ring? Um, so one is about, I mean, what is the social norm that they have to obey, that they have to, they are trying to, to make sense of what is the, what is appropriate for, for males. And, and the other is about the homophobia. So I I, 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 I ask them, uh, can I ask you something? What's, what's wrong with being gay? And I say, uh, well, uh, it's fine as far as they don't mess with us. It's fine, they can be gay. So you see, that's, 
about norms, that's about uh, the, the toxic organization of boys. Um, in many places, and this is here, in 2018, in the US, I was raised, I was a teenager 20, 30 years earlier in Nicaragua, and it's very similar uh, dynamic around how, what are the social norms, what are the expectations, how boys are supposed to behave, and what are supposed to be okay, appropriate, what is not supposed to be appropriate. So I think all this uh, work is extremely relevant. Just uh, want to comment quickly that um, I would like to ask to the Women for Women uh, intervention about, I, it, it sparked my curiosity about your recommendation on focuses on, on the knowledge and behavior before adding it. It is an interesting discussion, so when the question and answer uh, comes, um, I'm curious about that. I really uh, echo the recommendation of training men for longer time and combine different modalities, but we know this is so ingrained, so ingrained that even what are called activists or experts, we have to continue doing our work, our personal work. We, from time to time, fall into the patriarchal mode. We don't sometimes even know it, sometimes we realize that after we did what we did not make the comment that we made. So it's so important to, add, to allocate time and resources for, for doing this work. This, this work. Um, I also want to echo what um, Ruthie says about recognizing trauma and also saying that male and female socialization is traumatizing itself. It is really traumatized the way we, we raise our boys and, and girls. It is very traumatizing, and we have to con con consider that. I like the way that you said opportunities for gender synchronization, looking for that, not necessarily in all contexts, I guess, right? In some, in some contexts, <laughs> there is no need or, or, or it's not appropriate to, to try to put men and women together or boys and girls together. And I also want to echo the, I mean, to recognize the decontribution of Comundo in one of the peers' organizations, proposing this positive alternative. This, this, uh, uh, the uh, alternative, not just criticizing toxic masculinity, but also showing that it is possible another way of being a male. Of being male. I think that has been extremely important. One of the, uh, yeah, this morning I received an email from uh, Ronald Hobart from uh, here in Uganda, telling me that he's joining this, was joining this, uh, his, this um, event on, on, online and reminding me that he's going to, he's now in, in the north of Uganda, supporting uh, the humanitarian crisis in South Sudan. So it's, it's and we think we, we worked before about how to support rural men as role model, as, as caring men in their communities. Um, so, just, just uh, as a matter of, of conclusion, I think integrating holistic approaches, multiple components, level, multi sector uh, approaches are extremely important. We need to create more alliance, more network, more partnerships. That's extremely important. And I think that's the, the, the offer that many gays has, I and mean, that we can work together because all these multi components levels, sometimes it's difficult that one civilization can do all of that. You need to collaborate with others. You might do it, you might only work at more the individual level, the community level, but you need other organizations that can work at other levels as well. I think it's very important also to, res to recognize this, that men have to advocate for and respect the women feminist spaces. That we have also to contrast the pressure to engage men in all initiatives. That it is important also to preserve some, some spaces that have been built very difficult by, by feminist women. That we, we are not just pushing for that all the time in all the space, these spaces. I think it's important to, to remember. This is about accountability. This is about being accountable, about recognizing what, where this, this work comes from and what is the, the commitment that uh, the engagement of oil fields and men, particularly working on this have uh, on this work. So I will stop that so that we can have some 
interesting discussions. Sorry, <coughs> just a second. I'm Josh Hoffner, a senior communication specialist here at ICRW. I recognize that we're at time. So if people need to go now, there's no respect to your time. As you can see, it's we have a lot to talk about on this topic. So um, for those of you who need to leave, feel free to. Otherwise, we're happy to sit and answer a few minutes uh, of your questions. Um, and thank you all for coming today. Yeah, um, and as some people are walking out, um, I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware that our next event will be on March 8th uh, for International Women's Day. And ICRW will be hosting a high-level panel discussion moderated by NPR's Nina Totenberg on strategies to address sexual harassment and gender-based violence domestically and internationally. And that will also include Congressman, Congresswoman Jackie Spear and Carmenos President and CEO Gary Barker. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of great people there. Uh, that will be March 8th at 5.30 p.m. So email Julia Gross if you would like to RSVP and we all know her email you're not sure how to spell that, so we can help you out. <laughs> um, and with that being said, and um, thank you so much to Alfredo for, for wrapping it up and reminding us how important this is um, and how real it is. Um, and to start our discussion, I'd like to ask the panel, um, what are some of the challenges to engaging men at the institutional level? Um, and how can we overcome them without instrumentalizing men or without marginalizing uh, women and their voices. I can, I can start just sharing one thing. I think um, it's important. I think institutional spaces are an opportunity because they're, they offer a structure. So they are an opportunity to, to organize lots of people on these issues. And I actually I want to share that in Men Engage Alliance, there are several member organizations in different countries that have really been able to build on the Me Too momentum. Uh, and some of like one of key institutions are companies. And if some businesses are actually saying, oh dear, this may happen in our own company. How are we going to deal with this? And so some businesses have reached out to organizations that they know work with men and boys and have invited them to organize dialogue spaces about this. And I remember one of the men engaged members saying, well, if there's one thing we know how to do, then it's bring men together and talk about these issues. But it has also been said that needs to be a consolidated effort. So I think institutions are opportunities to engage men. You need to get men in power. So at the CEO level to really commit on this at board level, be part of it, organize, this, organize these spaces to talk about this, do it with everybody, not just men alone but really have women's voices presented in that and then work towards institutional policies, et cetera, but keep organizing those dialogue spaces. It has to be a continued effort um, to really change organizational culture. One thing I would add is um, kind of how we looked at the program level, like helping men to see the benefits of gender equity and how it benefits them. I think that can work a bit at the institutional level as well. So as Yoni said, helping companies or organizations see how gender equity can help advance their mission and their goals of business. It can help your bottom line, you know, a company or an organization, whatever programming you're doing, help them understand how gender equity will actually contribute to what they're trying to achieve and is kind of part of their mission. Yeah, I mean, I think just to add to what, what everybody's been what everybody's saying is <laughs> you really have that awareness as well. Like um, it, at every level, that we really need to be more inclusive, and that we can't be dominated by by just one or the you know men, men versus women, and and vice versa. It's women for women international. Um, all, we're about we're actually you know we're a, we're a women uh, women's organization, but we do have fifty percent, uh, almost about fifty percent of, of our staff is men, wow. and especially especially in the field. And so we really work hard at ensuring that that is, you know, that that equality is there and that awareness is there of gender equity throughout our policies and at programs. So the curriculum that we that I talked about for our men's engagement program starts with talking about gender roles and, the, and gender dynamics and gender equity and equality. 
And the same goes for the women, the, the core program that we have for the 12, for the women that we work with. Just one quick addition. I think that the idea of sort of at that level being relatively instrumental is very good, right? So you say, okay, well, you know, a minister, for example, maybe he or she is very interested in gender equality. They have goals, they have votes that they need to get. So try to align yourself with what, you know, what their goals are and, and showing how an approach like this can help. But I think we also have to be a little bit careful about like Yoni was saying, that these are often seen as these sort of silver bullet solutions, um, and to make sure that when policies are suddenly enacted, that the kind of potential harmful uh, side effects, let's say, are, are being take, you know are being taken into consideration. So, you know, there's a very classic example of um, you know men's accompaniment of women to antenatal care has shown some positive outcomes. So you have countries saying, okay, so men who accompany their you know women who are bringing their partners to Antenatal care get to jump in line. They get to be the first to get services. Probably not the best approach, right? So, so you know, thinking a little bit about about consequences there as well. It's really important. And it's, this is, I think, a particularly easy solution, particularly for male policymakers to take on board, because um, you can keep it pretty patriarchal. So, um, just something to be careful about. Um, so I think, yeah, I see it. I see it all. Um, I just want to check. We do three to start with and then, yeah. You know, I think so. Just a few minutes and then, you know, if, if we don't get to all the questions, we're happy to, to, to take the questions down and, and try to respond to you and you know, pass it around among the panelists and everything and, and get back to you with what we can't. We'll try to do a few uh, questions before we go today. Yeah. Um, okay, let's do the front of the orange notebook, sorry, and then one row back and then all the way back. You got you. Okay. Sorry, it's not all but <laughs> no, thank you. I really like the um the, the, the citation gave from this uh activist Yolanda because it shows that there's a, a power struggle here that we cannot hide behind our little finger, right? If you have to give up your power, the power that you have had just because you are male and you live in a patriarchal society, then this message has to be passed on. And it's always very difficult for any human being to give up on power, right? Mm -hmm. So that others can get more power. And I was wondering, you talk about, a lot about what men have to gain in um, uh, uh, equity, right? And in a more uh, equitable society. But maybe uh, uh, echoing a bit what Osvaldo said, is there any discourse on what society has to lose with a patriarchal uh, society? Because if you, as you rightly said, you know, a mass shooting, right? That is probably the fruit of masculinity images. What is it we all have to lose? And we are going to lose our boys, our girls, our daughters, our, uh, our sons. Uh, we are to, we're going to increase in unhappiness. We are socially and collectively going to be much more unhappy and it's going to have an economic cost, which is sometimes not a very nice discourse to have, but something that people can hear. You know, how much a patriarchal society costs to your pocket? How much domestic violence costs to your pocket? How much you know you could gain in a society by having a more equal uh, 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 setting for everyone? You know, uh, across races, uh, uh, sexual options, whatever, right? And what it costs? Because usually we don't have that. You know. What what is the cost of patriarchy? Oh, sorry, question. <laughs> that was really in, uh, great question. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, uh, sorry. My name is Sarah Nyambotoboyer, and I work in capacity development at PACT. And so my question really is kind of, as a capacity developer, for lack of a better term, builder sometimes, I was really, I really appreciated hearing that term, gender, Synchronized gender synchronization. I've been up talking at my organization for the longest, so we need to stop looking at gender through silos, but gender as an ecosystem, and how men and women inform on one one another. So my question is for all whoever on the panel can, if you could speak a little bit more to this idea of the gender synchronization or ecosystem approach. If there are any examples of this being operationalized or implemented, and is this something that could be scaled up or implemented at a, using um, a systems approach as well? So not only looking at those individual actors or even on the CSO level, but is it possible to strengthen that entire system and make it more resilient, for example, to, to these kind of shocks that may affect gender? 
I liked her question too. <laughs> um, so, hi, my name is Afif Abdurrahman. I'm a gender advisor working in the uh, USA Global Health Bureau. And um, first, I wanted to say that I'm so, it, it resonated so much with me, um, Oswaldo, about your, your point about um, bad apples and what that means, not only in the development world, but also within the US spaces. And I wanted to say that I appreciate very much um, the talk around Black Lives Matter and around other sort of trends within our current society that um, speak to this patriarchal system and how we need to bring this closer to home, not only with the populations we work with in other countries. Um, my question actually links to what you were saying earlier about power and the idea that this isn't a zero sum game. Um, so I wanted to know from the panel, um, how do, if, if we're talking about power and the shifts or, or the exchange of power, how do men define power? I've always been curious about that. How do men define power? And what are some of the lessons learned with addressing this idea of power as a zero sum game? I think it came out in a couple of presentations. And then finally, how uh, someone else, also, someone also mentioned how um, the work of redefining power for men. So I was hoping you could talk more about that because to me, that's like, the, that's the crux of the issue for much of what we're, we've been talking about. Thank you. Should we maybe just go down the line, taking whichever ones we want? I can start. Yeah, go. Sure, okay. So I just picked a few pieces. There were even many questions within the questions. Um, so you talked about kind of, is there any work being done around the cost of patriarchy? And so I will give a shout out to ICRW that we're currently doing some work on costing of sexual harassment to companies. So of course, this is a small slice of the pie, but um, the point I made earlier that we often think of just legal costs and you know the costs that come out of firing that person, the perpetrator, once an allegation comes out, but rather we're trying to look at kind of the ecosystem that creates an environment where sexual harassment happens. What are all the financial costs associated with productivity, retention, absenteeism, other team members, not even the harassing, but others kind of having to reduce product productivity and all of that sort of thing. Um, so that's one example, and hopefully we'll have some reports coming up out in the next few months about that. Um, and then the other question, just kind of a really specific response around any examples of programs that are kind of looking at the gender ecosystem and across kind of the ecological model, I think, of individuals and all of communities. So a great example, maybe you already know, is the SASA program implemented by Raising Voices. So they're Raising Voices is an organization in Uganda, but kind of similar to how Ruti was talking about program H&M, SASA is all over the world now being adapted. Um, and it's the core of the program is around power and kind of working power with, changing power over to power within, to power together, um, a whole methodology there. And it works with <laughs> community mobilization, working with health workers, police workers, judicial members, advocating at the local level. So yeah, it's an amazing program. I'll stop there. Sure. Um, we'll say similar things. Um, so I think that this issue of sort of how do you frame, I mean, I think I can tell you about a costing study. We are also trying to do <laughs> actually around um, really much framing it around costs of sort of rigid norms around masculinity, focusing on, on three areas, sexual harassment is one, um, mental health, and then risk behaviors like drinking and traffic accidents. Now, there's a lot of studies of those things, what we're trying to do, so, you know, if you go online and Google, like, cost of, of binge drinking or cost of alcohol use to society, you can find that, you can find studies on costs of violence. Um, I do think that is a, a but they're not linked to masculinity. No, so that's what yeah, that's what we're trying to do with. So they, they, they are these studies, but they never link to masculinity. Um, but I think you know, there's there's bigger questions around that too. Of yes, I think you can make the case of the harm around it. I think one of the cases that's you see it a lot more in the media now, but we should see more. But I was an event, at an event yesterday or a few days ago where the person was talking about having. You know, this is a very senior person talking about having a son and a daughter, and you know, seeing the differences between them and how the world treats them. And then he focused on, you know, 
And I want to make sure that my daughter grows up in a particular world. So I think sort of expanding that to say, well, I want to make sure that my son grows up in a particular world. Like as well, those same types of socialization there. It's going to help your daughter a whole lot too. Um, but you know, so I think there's different ways of framing what the costs are uh, to society. And I think a lot of us in our work, in fact, try to try to talk about that both financial cost and otherwise. Um, uh, I, addressing power, yeah, I think I can't. I can't answer this question of how do men define power, but I think a lot of what this critical reflection process is is thinking about that. What what is power? How how does one? Where does one feel like they have power, and in what circumstances do they not? And again, I think often a lot of our community program is actually working with relatively marginalized men. So they often have power over women in their communities. They don't have a lot of power over a lot of other things. And so recognizing that allows them to reflect on power across different issues, right? So when you see, oh, I don't appreciate this kind of power that others have over me, oh, look how I'm doing that. Um, and I think that's where we also find a lot of uh, links in how suddenly you see men thinking about, and women, thinking about violence against women and intersections with violence against children, because suddenly you see like, oh, you know, here I'm learning about how I'm not supposed to hit my child and how that's bad for them. Is that also bad for my wife? Um, and I'm taking this literally as a quote from, from, from a program that, that I've been involved with. Um, and then the last one around synchronization, I think there's a lot of interest in that, and synchronization being not necessarily programs that have men and women together in the same program, but, um, you know, where you have complementary parallel activities for both men and women, um, potentially other groups as well. Um, you know, we, we find that that is useful. Um, and there's also a big evaluation that's happening, I think, with uh, and gender health, I think, in Ethiopia has a program where they're actually able to test, you know, a program that is just for men, a program that is just for women, and a program that is for couples, and they'll be able to show kind of what seemed to work, what didn't work, and I think that should be coming out next year. So. Um, sorry, it's the Harvard MIT. Yeah, doing Harvard the evaluation. That, that, exactly. Right. Yep. Thank you. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would just say that at least um, getting to that question of of, of of really examining power structures, I know that a lot of these organizations, ours included, are using the whole um, the whole conversation of having that whole conversation and exercises and group work and about power to power over power within. We, we're doing that currently in Rwanda actually right now, where we did have separate groups of men and women, our advocates, who then come together. To, to do joint advocacy work together as a community, um, but they talk a lot about what are these power and power uh, dynamics in, in their own relationships and kind of overcoming that. Um, and I just wanted to um, address a question I think as well that you had raised about, um, about knowledge versus uh, behavior and attitude. Some of the research that we've seen, that I've seen at least, is that if uh, it, takes a, it takes longer and more concerted effort to change attitudes, but that behavior and knowledge change is um, seen, you know, that it takes less less time for that. So that's where that was kind of, um, that's where I was coming. Yeah, I think a lot of it has been said already, uh, but to speak to the, the, the whole kind of economic, kind of the business case, as it's called sometimes, I'm reminded by a quote by Ban Ki Moon who said, we need to convince everybody it's not only the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do. And I think there has been a, quite a bit developed around why working on gender equality or having gender just outcomes is a smart thing to do. Um, at the same time, I think it's also risky mm -hmm. uh, because I really, I, I'm an idealist in that sense and an activist, I really do believe we have to do it because it's the right thing to do. And I think communicating the smart thing is sometimes help as an entry point. But we should never use that kind of the, the social justice outcome in all of this. And I want to share here that we have the UN Charter on Human Rights, which outlines that agenda for me. And it's been agreed by the global community, right? So we have tools around what, what is the right thing to do that we can build on. Uh, in terms of gender synchronization, for me, that really that question really brings home two concepts, the importance of context and the importance of partnerships. Because I think in any kind of work that we do, we, we cannot just say this worked here, it worked there as well. 
So that makes context very important. And then partnership is really bringing people together from all kinds of diversities. And that's then where the gender synchronization happens. And discuss together what, what does our context look like? What are the problems that we have? And what are the joint solutions that we have? So that everybody is part of that conversation. Um, and on, yeah, I mean, power, power over um, is, is a concept that I think, you know, the feminist scholars have for a long time said that's not very helpful in the context of empowerment. And how can we think about power as power with, as collective power, as transformative power? So I was uh, asked to speak a bit on a panel last week on uh, men and masculinities and transforming power, or so, or men and men politics. And, um, and the question that I had to answer was, how can we get men to cede power, to give up power? And to me, that's the wrong question. Um, because I think, yes, men have, I think when you, when you have frank discussions about this, about power, sometimes it's easier for people to talk about it, to say, explain about, or talk about gender in your life, or talk about how patriarchy acts out in your life. Talk about how power acts out in your life is actually something that we hear a lot on the ground. Actually, people have a lot to share about that. It's a concept that resonates with people. But I think we can then move to an understanding of collective and joint power um, that I would say is more kind of productive. Um, not seeing power as a zero sum game, which I think you already said. Thank you for those questions. Um, I think we have time for one more, but I just want to make sure Amola, if you had anything to add. Just, yeah. just uh, your, your response about working on, on knowledge and, and, and behavior. I, I thought that it was because working on attitudes create more defensiveness in men mm -hmm. from, from up front. That was just. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think we have time for one more question. I saw your hand before, so I'm going to go with you. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, so I just had a question in terms of domestic and international, but since you guys are international, how do you kind of personalize the violence that? men might be um, having toward partners in terms of making the link to how they would feel if their sisters or their daughters were facing that same thing. So any thought kind of on that? I mean, assuming that they value that relationship and how they would see that and reframing the conversation. I don't know, I just have kind of like a personal reaction to that, but maybe yes. you guys can talk more on how it actually works from programmatically. I find it kind of bugs me when men say, well, my daughter and my sister, because they are personalizing it to that one woman. And like, because they love her, they wouldn't want it to happen to her, but it's fine that that happens to women in society. So I think, I don't quite know the answer there, but I, I think you almost want to you want to go back to that human rights thing, it's just wrong. That's why you should want it, not because of your sister. But I don't know, you guys have more experience in this space. I would say the way that I would answer it that way too. And then you relate. Yeah. Yeah. So there's your own They could relate it back. Like, yeah. not right. using it as a scapegoat, but like, it's, I guess yeah. it's a starting point. want this point. to happen to your it's it's starting, starting, it's starting. But you have to move away from that, though. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's. For me, uh, I remember having this conversation very vividly actually at the Men Engage Symposium with some folks that, you know, there's one thing about sort of the, the rhetoric that we're all sharing here that I think does resonate very often at the community level, but sometimes you do have to start with certain, certain starting points. And yes, sometimes talking about protecting someone in your family is the starting point, and then you start breaking down the sort of, well, why are you talking about protection as opposed to this person's sort of right and way of being? So it's a starting point, but it's definitely something you want to work against, because otherwise, yeah, it's sort of about, and also, it's also very paternalistic, right? It's not just, mm -hmm. I don't want that to happen to that person, it's, it is my role then to protect, mm -hmm. and which that's a problematic. My women, that kind of thing. Yeah, my women, exactly. yeah, yeah. 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 So I'll have to get your hand in here. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you everybody so much for coming and for sticking around for so long and for all these great questions. Um, and we'll make sure if you have any other questions that we'll connect you or find your answer, hopefully. Um, and we'll see you next time.